What does being recently included into the Pharmacog Consortium mean for you and your lab? Well, I guess the first thing it means is we're quite excited about it, and uh, I guess time will tell what it really brings to us. But um, let me tell you a little, about, a little bit about what this is. So Pharmacog is um, a quite large EU, European Union funded research consortium um, that brings together in a formal collaboration with a number of work plans, a number of the large pharmaceutical companies, most of those household names that people know, along with a range of academic groups um, around the European Union. And the goal is to concentrate on understanding uh, how we may better be able to test drugs in Alzheimer's disease in the future, starting with some of the sort of preclinical studies that we do in my lab, in terms of understanding disease models and going through and actually including studies in man and working with patients and trying to understand, okay, what's the best thing going to be to measure in sufferers to tell us that a drug's working? Because that is always a challenge when you get to the end of the drug discovery process. But we've been included because of our neurophysiological uh, expertise, working on the mouse models, uh, which are the early stages of these sorts of um, research portfolios. And really, the idea is to see what we could understand and how that could then be translated up into what goes wrong in the human brain, uh, working with some of the people there who are doing neurophysiological measurements in patients, for example, um, using EEG methods, those sort of big skull caps that people put on with lots of electrodes. And then just beginning to see whether this can be worked into assessing how new therapies will be working in Alzheimer's disease. Because no doubt there will be new therapies coming along in the future and they will need to be tested in clinical trials and we need to understand how to do this better. And actually how you do that has to go from basic understanding in disease models right through to understanding disease in humans and you basically need that entire spectrum. Which is why this is quite a large consortium and it has getting on towards 30 million euros of funding. It's involving about 25 or 30 groups. We meet face to face a couple of times a year and it does go from people, as I said, like us, studying things in the laboratory in, um, in vitro or in vivo through to people studying, working with um, sufferers. Mm. So it's exciting. We'll see what it brings to, um, for the lab. Um, certainly we are very happy to be involved with both the other academic partners and also, of course, all the pharmaceutical companies who are involved in this because actually, in the end, to really make progress and actually get towards, of course, the ultimate goal of really eliminating Alzheimer's disease, you need both academics and pharmaceutical companies. What techniques do you currently use in your research and are there any other areas you're thinking of looking into in the future? Well, yeah, so I've really, you know, I've, I've been doing electrophysiology for 25 years now and I guess the only other thing I've really done much of um, is some imaging, um, some real-time physiological type imaging. Um, as uh, really is uh, to help us kind of understand some of those things that are going on. Let's talk about the neurophysiology first. So really, although, you know, you'd say, well, why don't you do all the other things you should be doing by chemistry and histology? And well, we, we try to like do one thing and try and do it reasonably well. And that's, so we, we focus on neurophysiology, but however, what we do really goes right from the single channel recording the activity of single molecules in little bits of membrane, right through to in vivo electrophysiological recordings in freely moving um, rodents. So we do really cover the entire spectrum from studying single molecules to studying whole behaving networks in awake animals. Mm. So obviously this means that we aren't just using one technique. We're not just using, for instance, this microscope here to patch clamp brain slices, but we look at cultures, we look at recombinant channels a little bit. We do do a lot of work in brain slices, but actually having worked in brain slices now for 25 years, I am increasingly beginning to appreciate the fact that that's still a model and it's a very useful model in vitro, but to really understand how the brain works, we also need to be working on the intact circuits, um, which actually means working on the intact brain. I mean, going forward, of course, yes, imaging, single suppressance imaging, high speed, real time imaging, more of that is something we'd really like to do. So multi-photon imaging, both in vitro and in vivo, certainly areas in which we would love to expand. It would need some funding, we need some success with grants, we're very happy to have people around in Bristol um, who are doing these sort of techniques now. We've recently got MRC funding, for example, so there are people we can collaborate with and begin to build that expertise into our work. I mean, it's been really combining electrophysiological measurements, neurophysiological measurements, and imaging measurements in the same experiments is really adds an awful amount of power, and that's something you know we, we really want that power in our own research. Uh, we do a little bit of the imaging, but not at the level we'd like to yet. But largely for the other stuff. We like to collaborate, so you know, instead of doing the biochemistry ourselves, we like to find a biochemist who really is a biochemist and uh, collaborate with them. So, our focus is neurophysiology. We'd like to expand more into doing more simultaneous imaging or using real-time um, 
imaging techniques, um, but and then collaborating to do all the other important stuff because although electrophysiology is really how the brain works, that's the electricity working. It isn't really the only way we could understand it and obviously there are other things and other techniques we need to encompass into our research. So in the last 25 years in this field, how has technology improved? I mean, it's really been quite, I guess like most things in our life, remarkable in a way. I mean, in the end, we're doing quite similar things. I mean, what I did when I first walked in 25 years ago was stick a small glass pipette filled with a salty solution onto a cell or um, into some cells and to record the electrical activity that was going on there. We knew that had been there for a while. Um, but of course, at the time, I mean, of course, the key thing that's affected most of our lives, of course, things like the computing power that we had available to us. So we could have an amplifier, that, an analog amplifier that was producing those electrical measurements, but then we had to send it somewhere, and we had to store it somehow, and uh, you know, we had to try and store it. So we used to store it on great big reel-to-reel -reel tapes. I'm just about old enough to remember some of those, which we could play at various speeds. Very expensive. We had some of the early computers. The first computer I ever used for electrophysiology had disks about. 12 inches or so which sort of looked like LP records and, but just after that we soon got down to the sort of smaller floppy disks and then you know we've seen the evolution of that but of course now we're able to have massive sampling rates from massive numbers of channels at the same time that allows us for example to have a 128 electrodes which we're sampling at 50 kilohertz constantly into us one standard desktop PC without anything really particularly fancy there no real great cost um, so obviously computing has revolutionized that. We also now have computer controlled amplifiers. So, you know, the days of amplifiers with knobs on the front uh, are not gone yet, but um, you know, a lot of them just have little computer interfaces, sometimes simplify our jobs, many more things are logged. Um, and then I guess we just get down to some of the mechanics. I mean, the microscopy, the manipulators, those things have really evolved quite a lot over the years. So we are able, to put many electrodes into an air very stably without much drift um, compared to how we were. We had mechanical manipulators that worked on principles of mechanical advantage and long levers and things. Beautifully engineered things we worked with in the past, but actually, you know, a little clunky, shown to drift a bit. And the microscopes didn't allow us to do all the sorts of things. There's been advances in just the types of microscope, the types of microscopy to allow us to see deeper into brain tissue, for into slices of brain, for example. Mm -hmm. So really, we are making quite similar measurements. We're often able to make them much more easily and much more quickly, many more at the same time, possibly, over long periods. And of course, I think that does reflect the fact that although there are those of us in at the coalface sticking our electrodes in and actually doing those experiments, you know, there's a whole world outside of people supplying us with better engineering solutions, better computing solutions, lower noise amplifiers that really enable everything we do. Mm -hmm. And those things are very, very important advances to us. I mean, the computing, we just couldn't do some of the experiments we do now do without the sort of computing that's developed in the last 10 years or five years. We, we couldn't have basically even stored the data with any, any sort of realistic way. I mean, we don't worry now about going and recording five gigabytes of data because we can carry it around on a little memory stick if we want to. You know, five gigabytes of data 10 years ago, we wouldn't really know what to do with it. So yeah, I think equipment's important. It's evolved because in the end, we're trying to do, we're basically doing the same things, but we are doing it with better tools. So I mean, I guess the other things that have changed, you know, beyond the technology, are the sorts of things that we understand about the diseases we're working on. You know, we have so much more knowledge that's been driven by all the different approaches that have been taken, to example, for Alzheimer's disease. I mean, we now have much better hypotheses about what's going wrong in the brain, things that we can actually target to direct our experiments uh, in the search for new therapies. And also we have you know, the great advances in, that have come from the human genome and from genetics that we now have transgenic mice that model aspects of the disease in ways that we really couldn't have dreamt of 25 years ago. So we have you know, aspects of the disease process much, that are much better modeled that allow us to really probe what's going on in much better ways. I mean, and looking forward, you know, the genetics and the people doing that sort of work, understanding the genetic basis of underpinning disease, just the things that give you the risk factors of having Alzheimer's, for example, are telling us much more about maybe how the circuits go wrong or where we should be looking to understand where these problems come from. Because in the end, we're measuring what's wrong but we also constantly need to be aware of why this is wrong or we need to be saying 
is this really cause or effect? I mean, okay, is, is this something which is actually causing the circuits to go wrong or causing neurons to die? Or is actually this the brain trying to respond to what's actually going wrong? And this is really the brain maybe trying to compensate for the changes. So we always have to have those, bear those things in mind, but really we have much stronger frameworks on which to base our experiments now because of the advances in the understanding of the human disease through genetics and also through modeling it uh, in preclinical species.